combustion chemistry that Professor Green. So I was just thinking back, you know, the uh, summer school in terms of chemistry coverage. We have a different different instructors. We started out with, you know, I don't know whether any one of you were here in the first one. We we had the Dr. Klippenstein covering it, the Charlie Westbro covering it, Mike Pitting does it, and then Hai Wong did it. And uh, and then now finally I got Professor Green to, to spend the time to prepare the lecture. Uh, one thing I can say that you know you probably none of you have gone through the sessions, but if you go there, you can see a different perspective. So even if you had to before and look at it, it's, it's different. And uh, so I'm just so happy that Professor Green agreed to do it and rush back from Europe uh, on Friday and, and right away come here. So well, we we thank you. Thank you. So again, you run your show. Yep, no problem. Yeah, so uh, I want to thank you for coming. I know it's very difficult to listen to three hours of lectures in the morning and then come and be brave enough to come for three hours of lectures in the afternoon. Um, I'll try my best to keep this entertaining, but of course it'll be best the, the more you guys can interact with me, that it'll be more interesting for everyone. I also want to tell you that this topic, combustion chemistry, that I'm going to tell you about is a very huge topic. Um, it's usually the biggest group at the combustion symposia are the papers from this topic. And it's... Uh, there's been tremendous breakthroughs uh, since the time that I was a graduate student. So th since that time, has been a really uh, amazingly changes in this field. Um, and there's still a lot of really big problems that are not solved. Uh, so anyway, in, in the 15 hours of lectures that we have scheduled this week on this topic, you know, I can really, I'm just going to like brush the surface and try to give you an overall view. Um, and then if you really get serious about it, you know, then you'll have to take some more courses and uh, work with somebody later. Sorry about that. But I'll try my best to get you in a good state. Um, let me just tell you a minute about myself. So I was trained as a chemist. I originally did experiments uh, about rate theory, uh, various fundamental experiments. And then later I learned how to be a quantum chemist. Um, and then I worked for Exxon for six years, up the road from here, uh, in their fuels and lubricants division. I worked on fuel chemistry. Um, and then uh, and I went to MIT. And now I'm at MIT and the, the HODL professor there. Um, and my specialty really is about kinetics, about the rates of reactions. Um, but uh, I also, uh, it's important to understand the big view, the overview of what you're doing. And so we're going to start by taking the big view, and then we'll get more and more microscopic uh, as, the, as the week goes on. Um, I, I need to thank a lot of people. Um, uh, what I didn't realize, well, I, I did realize, actually. Ed, Ed uh, has been trying to get people to come teach this course for a long time. And it's, uh, it's a lot of work to teach 15 hours of lectures, actually. It's like, uh, I don't know, a third of a, of a course, a semester course, all at once. And trying to prepare it all at once is like a big job. Um, so I was too lazy to do it all. So I, uh, I talked to my colleagues and got them to give me a lot of slides. And that I, uh, if you see the nice slides here, probably they're all by, made by somebody else. And many of them are made by these people here, um, all of whom are tremendous scientists. And I also want to thank many of my students. Uh, I'm stealing from their figures that they made with hard work, and I appreciate them very much. All right, so I'm going to talk about the big picture first um, and the motivation for why we care about uh, combustion chemistry. And then, then I'll start talking about how we uh, calculate combustion chemistry, understand thermochemistry, and get more and more detailed as the week goes on. All right, so start with the big picture. So what is a fuel? We want to do combustion chemistry, combustion, the chemistry of fuels. Um, and so fuels are an energy carrier. We use it as carrying energy, and we carry it in the chemical bonds of the fuel. Um, and when the fuel is reacted, which typically reacted with the oxygen in the air, um, most of the energy is released as heat. Um, and then we use the heat to run heat engines to provide electricity or uh, transportation or motive power. Um, and the reason we do this is because the fuels have extremely high energy densities compared to almost anything else. And so if you want to have a large amount of energy in a small uh, container, then you want to do it with a fuel because chemical bonds carry so much energy. And little, you know, a few angstroms of a bond has like 100 kcals per mole. It's just a, very large, large amount of energy. Um, 
The complexity of this is that we release the energy. It's not like a battery where you just turn the switch and the battery comes, the, electric, the power comes out, the energy comes out. Um, we have to actually do it with chemical reactions. And the chemical reactions uh, have a mind of their own. And they run at their own rates. And the it's not just a single reaction. It's actually a very complicated sequence of reactions. Um, and so that makes the whole thing a big mess. It, gives, it makes it hard for us to control what's happening. Um, and it leads to uh, making of emissions and other undesirable byproducts. Um, and it causes all kinds of control problems when you try to run an engine. Um, but that's, that's the trade-off. So we get the benefit of having a huge amount of energy that we're carrying around. It's actually pretty cheap, too. Um, but the disadvantage is we have to understand all this complicated chemistry and try to control it as best we can. And it turns out that the chemical details matter a lot. Um, and so for those of you who are mechanical engineers, I'm sorry. It's just the truth. I didn't make the world this way. That's the way God made the world, that the chemical details actually matter. And so we're stuck with it. And we have to understand it. All right. So why do, anyway, why do we care about having energy is we really want transportation. So people are very happy that uh, people invented the car about 130 years ago or something. And, uh, and you know, anybody given the choice would like to have a car or a motorbike instead of walking everywhere. So uh, cars are very popular. Um, uh, trucks are very, very popular. In the old days, we used to have mules that p pulled carts. And you know, anybody, you give them a truck, they'll use the truck instead of the mule. Uh, so trucks are much be better. Uh, airplanes, I, I bet a lot of you came here on airplanes. Um, in the old days, um, uh, John Adams came from Boston down to here, just like I came from Boston to here. But it took him three months because he had to walk and ride a horse and take a raft down the river and stuff like that. And I just got on the airplane, and I was here an hour and a half later. So uh, airplanes are a lot nicer. Um, and because people want uh, the transportation so much, it makes the demand for fuel what's called inelastic by the economists. So that means that uh, once somebody buys a car, almost certainly they will pay for the gasoline to drive the car. Doesn't matter what price the gasoline is, they'll buy it. Because they already invested you know, $20,000 in the car, so spending four bucks, five bucks, six bucks for a gallon of gasoline is no big whoop by comparison. So every time there's a car sale, along with that is selling so many thousands of gas gallons of gasoline are going to be used by that car. Right? And so we see that now, for example, in the countries in Asia where their economies are improving, people are buying a lot of cars you can bet your bottom dollar that they're going to buy a lot of gasoline, too, because they're not buying the car to sit in their driveway. Right. Okay. Um, but this is a problem. Uh, things that have inelastic demand make the economy very problematic, because the prices can fluctuate wildly. Um, the people are not very responsive. It's not like I say, oh, gasoline's kind of expensive today. I think I'll, I'll, you know, I won't drive today. I'm still going to drive, and I'll just pay a little bit extra. And so the price can actually spike up uh, wildly. And we'll see. I have some slides about that later. Um, another very important thing to keep in mind is liquid fuels are really the best. And that's because liquids flow. So back in the 19th century, um, the transportation system was based on coal. Uh, it was coal-powered steam engine trains. Um, and you can actually make a good system that way. And actually, I was just in the railway museum in uh, England last week. And they have uh, uh, trains at 120 miles an hour, which is actually faster than Amtrak does. And they use coal to, to run steam engines. So you work in the technology, you can make it work. But it was once people started to realize you could do it with diesel instead of using coal, it was very hard for the coal business to survive. Because it's so much easier to just get a tank, squeeze the nozzle, the, the diesel flows in. And they never touch it. You have a little fuel pump inside your train, and it just pumps the fuel in. Before, they had to have these guys shoveling the coal in the back. right? And, then the, and the bits of the coal would get jammed into the screws and the mechanism, and they make all this ash, and they have to like, chip it off. And they had you know, several guys riding on the train just taking care of the coal. But nowadays, they can just have one guy just pushes a button, the automatic starter, the diesel runs, it runs. And so, <laughs> hey, you know, once you switch to diesel, you're never coming back. right? Um, same with the Navy, right? Uh, back in the time of uh, Winston Churchill was the Secretary of the Navy in Britain, about 1900. And he is, his big innovation was he said, hey, we can use oil to run the battleships instead of coal. So they used to have like 500 guys in the battleship. Their whole job was just to shovel the coal 
into the engine. And then they said, hey, I can get rid of 500 sailors. I can have those guys go join the Marines and go march their death in the trenches of World War I instead. <laughs> uh, and so that was a big innovation. And all the battleships were riding in oil instead. Um, so, so anyway, this really is the best. It has very high volumetric and mass energy density. Um, and it's easy to store. It's easy to distribute. Liquid fuels, uh, you have a fuel tank. It doesn't have to be airtight. So it's not like a gas. So you, know, you can have pretty crummy tanks and still do pretty well and keep your liquid fuel in there. Um, and that's what we have all over. We have gas stations everywhere. They have liquid fuel tanks. You know, they put them in the ground. They probably leave them there 20, 30 years. And maybe they leak a little bit, but it's really not a big deal. It's easy to handle liquids. Um, you know, if, if they had gases, the natural gas, that'd be a big problem. If they had coal, you know, after a while, it'd have little fines of coal stuck everywhere and it'd be a total mess. Right. Um, and because this is, liquid fuels are so good and everybody wants transportation, we're using a humongous volume of liquid fuel. So about 80 million barrels per day are being burned of liquid fuel. And I cannot describe to you how big 80 million in barrels is, but you can buy a book at the bookstore that's called A Million. And all it is is a million periods, a million dots. And it's a book. It's like that thick. Every page is just more dots. And it gives you an idea of how big a million is. Um, it's like you know, a couple hundred page long book of just periods. To give you. So that's one million. And those are dots, not barrels of oil. And barrels of oil are pretty big. Right? So if you have a million of them, it's a lot. And 80 million of them is really a lot. And that much is being burned up every single day. So it's a tremendous quantity of liquid fuel is being consumed. OK, so this is about energy density. Um, and so this is a nice plot to have. It's a plot of the peak power you can get out of an uh, energy system and the uh, energy density in watt hours per kilogram. And the liquid fuels are all out here. So you know, gasoline, methanol, stuff like that. And they're out here. This is a log plot. So they're uh, approximately one order of magnitude better than the best batteries. Um, so if you want to go the same distance in your car, um, you need about 10 times the weight of batteries as the weight of gasoline that you would need. Now, uh, there is a car, a Tesla, that uses lithium-ion batteries. And that, uh, I think people are satisfied with that, that car. So that has, an, that has enough uh, energy that it carries with it and enough power density. So somewhere here, the peak of the lithium-ion range is sort of the minimum of what sort of is acceptable energy density. Um, and you can see the power density there is also about the same as gasoline. So lithium-ion batteries, you can kind of do it barely. But it's easy to do it with liquid fuels, because you have a, like a free extra order of magnitude of energy density available to you. Um, all, anything that's sort of to the left of this is energy densities that are not acceptable for transportation. So for example, lead-acid batteries, they use these some in golf carts. You can go maybe 10 miles an hour. You can go for a couple hours. That's it. So nobody drives golf carts. Right. Um, so if you want, you know, the energy density you need for, for transportation is, is out to the, you know, above 100 watt hours per kilogram. Now, liquid fuels are great, as I told you, but they also have some problems. So first of all, they're pretty expensive. So it costs you a premium of about an order of magnitude per joule compared to coal. Um, and depending on where you are, it could be about the same for natural gas. Um, and because the expense is high compared to other sources of energy, the big money in energy is all in liquid fuels. So the quantity of coal that we burn, the quantity of natural gas we burn, is approximately the same as the amount of oil we burn. But the amount of money that you make by selling the fuel is, is like an order of magnitude bigger for the oil. So this has a economic consequences that all the investment and all the efforts and stuff are all about the oil, because that's how you make money. And if you happen to get some coal and natural gas, OK, we sell that too. Um, and it's, it's a lot of money. So it's sort of like trillion dollar per year scale uh, for balance of payment flows from countries that don't have oil to countries that do have oil. And so this is big effects on the international economics. It's like monopoly. And one guy has all the hotels on boardwalk and stuff, and he just keeps collecting the money. Right? So that's, that's what the oil situation is like. Um, and now, it's a funny situation that the amount of, of money we spend on oil in this country is about $2,000 per year per person, um, which is pretty much money. 
on a, certainly on a graduate student stipend. But it's, uh, it's not really that much money compared to our total income. So the median income is something $40,000, $50,000 per year per person in the United States. And so you know, $2,000, you notice it, but it's not really a big deal. However, if you're in a country where the total income might be $500 a year, then $2,000 a year is a lot. It's more than you have, right? So it's a very big deal in, in poorer countries. Um, and so this is a very big problem that uh, people in those countries can't afford transportation, um, certainly not on the scale we have here. Um, and, and so that builds in the sort of a hidden demand that if the price were lower, a lot more people would be using transportation because they want to use transportation, they just can't afford it right now. Um, there's a defense issue, energy security, that the oil is mostly located far away from where people live. And this led to some big problems. So in the last 100 years, there were a couple different times when there were blockades or embargoes that prevented the free marketing of oil from places that had oil to people who wanted to buy it. And that was uh, pretty conclusive in World War I. It was definitely conclusive in World War II. And in fact, it started World War II. It started because uh, um, the US embargoed oil sales to Japan. Uh, or the, the big part of World War II. I guess the poor Chinese were already being attacked. I'm sorry. But, uh, but the, the expansion of the war was uh, very much affected by that. And then the Allies won the war to a large extent because they could blockade the oil transfer, transportation. Um, and then the, uh, the oil embargo in the 1970s also had devastating effects on the world economy. And so uh, the people who do geopolitical thinking and defense planning are very aware of this. And if you have to ask why the United States has a fleet stationed in Bahrain, it has nothing to do with Bahrain. It has to do with there's a lot of oil there. And they're all very aware of what happened um, during the world wars. And I think China, now that it's buying, people in China are buying a lot of cars, they all want to be able to drive their cars. And because of that, there's a natural interest that Chinese would like to be able to make sure they can get oil coming to their country too. And so I think a big part of why China is investing in its Navy is also concerned about blockades for oil. Um, and so this potentially is a very dangerous thing. And people in you know, the defense establishment are very aware of this. Um, another thing which I'm going to talk about more is the greenhouse gas problem. So about 30% of the CO2 emissions are associated with transportation fuels. Um, and uh, people have ideas about what to do about most of the other greenhouse gases. But I would say that we don't have very many good ideas of how to reduce the greenhouse gas from transportation. And so that's a huge challenge. And maybe you guys will help to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, also, urban air pollution, a lot of it is related to transportation, uh, combustion of liquid fuels. And uh, more and more evidence comes out about how harmful that is to human health and how it's reducing the lifetimes of people um, and increasing the uh, health expenditures because of trying to solve the problems from the emissions. So as a consequence of all these things, liquid fuels are really important. And what happens then is the governments get very heavily involved. Um, and because the government's involved, it's not just economics and engineering anymore. Now you have to worry about you know, politics, societal behavior, all kinds of complicated things that many of you in this room probably don't know much about, and I sure don't know much about. Um, but they're just, they're just as important for solving this problem as the, as the engineering or the science. Um, and we, uh, maybe if those of you who are interested in those kinds of things, it would be really behoove you to try to learn more about it because there's a great shortage of people, in, at least in this society, that know about engineering, economics, and uh, behavioral, social, political issues. There's all, in fact almost nobody. There's a very, very small number of people who are, are trained in all those different things. And unfortunately, the energy problems, most of them require all, all those things at the same time. All right, so a quiz question for you. So I want you to do is to think about it, write down an answer, and then talk to the person next to you. If there's three of you together, just talk to the three of you together. Um, so the question is, diesel engines are significantly more efficient than the conventional gasoline auto cycle engines, um, but they're also more expensive to manufacture. So why does it make sense for Europeans to use diesel cars, but the case for diesels is not compelling to Americans? So wait, wait, let's everything up.
All right, do we have a, anyone want to try to guess an answer in this one? Right back there. Yeah, okay, how many people will think this could be? Um, well, certainly people buy the crude oil that makes the fuel they want to make the best. But I think the crude oil comes in tankers and they could ship it anywhere in the world, so I don't think that could be it. Yeah? I think as a matter of fact, diesel was for a long time actually worse here in the States than in Europe. It's also because it was a lot higher. I think the reason actually is, uh, or a big reason actually, because from a drive side perspective, I think it makes actually sense for Americans to drive, I'm from Europe actually, so it makes actually sense for Americans to drive diesel cars because your drive is slower, you know, the salary thing as fast. As <laughs> so the conclusion is Americans are stupid. Well, okay. <laughs> How many people go with this answer? No, but the, but the emission legislation in this country is uh, so harsh that actually you have to add so much after treatment uh, that the car gets very expensive. So in Europe, the area actually you have to calibrate for your uh, emission legislation very small because you have the granny cycle. And the granny cycle. So yeah, so this is a very good point. So I don't know if you guys know this. That in Europe, um, there, there's two different emission regulations, US and Europe. They're very similar, but not exactly the same. And the way the regulations on NOx the, um, in the US, it's difficult to achieve it with a regular diesel engine. In Europe, it's pretty difficult to achieve too, but they've managed to make engines that can achieve it. Now, I, there's a good, deep, complicated political question about why the two countries decided, I think it's sort of factor two difference between what acceptable NOx levels are in the United States and what not acceptable NOx are, levels are in Europe. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, maybe part of it technical, but I think a lot of that's political. But I think that's, actually, I think the, the political part of that is influenced by a different factor, which he didn't mention. In the back. Wasn't the LA smog, uh, you know, the, the smog in LA that led to a kind of you know, knee-jerk reaction against diesels, and coupled with the fact that? Well, but I think that I think that people were driving car, gasoline cars that caused the smog. But maybe the, maybe they blamed the diesels. But I think in reality, the LA smog was mostly from cars. Maybe here. Uh, there is a tax uh, issue. So at some point. Uh, uh, for, in the past uh, century, uh, Europe had the technology which was uh, diesel, and the country wanted to promote this technology by decreasing uh, the tax on uh, diesel. Okay, so this is a tr this is a true thing too. So the the U the Europe during t during recent times, at least since I've been around, maybe before your time, uh, for reasons I'd not really understand why, started to lower the tax on diesel relative to the tax on gasoline. And that helped to encourage people to switch to diesel. So 30 years ago, not that many people in Europe drove diesels, actually. But now it's more diesels than, than gasoline cars, I believe, So uh, because of the, of the tax things. But why would, the, why would the government try to force people to drive diesels? Maybe here. Diesels are made more in Europe. And you can get it, you can get yeah, it but, cheaper. You can't get diesels prepared in the US. People just aren't educated and don't know how to take it. OK, so this is the stupid American theory again. Uh, <laughs> do we have a different, uh, a different variant? Here we go. Um, uh, no. So oil is definitely cheaper in the United States than it is in Europe because Europe doesn't have oil wells really and the US has a lot. Exactly. But the, the price differential is very slim because the tankers can ship the oil long distances without much difference. So I don't, that cannot be the answer. Yeah, in the back. So the overall cost of fuel in Europe is higher than America, so your break even is sooner on the diesel than it is. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is exactly right. So the, so what's the, anybody can tell me the price of, of diesel or gasoline in Europe? Anybody know a number? Anybody from Europe? 140. 140 per liter. 140 per liter. So what's the price of 140 what? Euro. Euro. So, we'll like so it's about two. Eight, eight to nine bucks per eight, gallon. Yeah, so eight or nine bucks per gallon. What's the price of, of fuel, gasoline in the US? Four. Four. So it's about a factor of two difference. Now that difference is not because of the cost of shipping oil it's not because of anything about the refineries, even though they are different. I mean, you know, maybe that's a 10% thing. It's not a factor of two. So that cost is all tax. OK, so the, Europe has a tremendously higher tax. Now, Europe did not have a high tax back uh, when I was born. So when I was born, the tax in Europe was small. The tax in the United States was small. The price was the price. It was actually standard oil made 
made the oil everywhere and sold it everywhere. And the price was the same, basically. So what happened was, during the 1970s, there was the Arab oil embargo. Um, and that really affected the Europeans a lot. And it scared them. And they said, oh my goodness, we can't be so dependent on oil in the future. And so they all got together in an amazing act of political will and decided to raise their, their gasoline taxes a ton. Um, and that was to try to discourage people from using so much oil, to try to make them less dependent on oil imports. So it was a, that was like a national security decision by all the European countries uh, to raise the, the tax on gasoline. So that made the uh, efficiency matter a lot more because the price is twice as high. Right? So if you save 10% of your fuel, you save a lot more money in Europe than you do in the United States. And so that's, that's the fundamental reason why people like to buy the diesels in Europe. Um, now, as the price here gets higher and higher, maybe at some point it starts to switch over and we should buy diesels here too. And maybe that's starting to come now. But uh, historically, it's not been true. You would actually, it's cheaper to buy a gasoline car and just burn the fuel because the fuel's cheap here. But over in Europe, it's the reverse. All right? So the, I thought it was, those are great answers, I have to say, too, because it uh, really brings out the multiplicity of issues involved in all these things. And there's even more issues which we could talk about more. But let's keep going. So price really matters. People re do respond to price in the sense that when they decide whether to buy a certain car or not, whether they care about the fuel economy depends on the price. So I, I was living here in the 1990s. At the time, the oil price was $16 a barrel, which is about, what, seven times lower than it is now. And at that time, do anybody remember what kind of cars people had in America in the 1990s? There's the huge ones, right? Hummers and, uh, and these, what are they called? The GM Suburbans, is that right? Chevy Suburban? The car's like about as big as this room, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, and then the price went up to be $100 a barrel instead of $16 a barrel. And now, do you, you ever see a Hummer out there? Now it's like a museum piece, right? You might see one once in a while as like an oddball thing. Before, it used to be you know, every, every yard had an SUV. There were more SUVs sold than, than regular cars in the 1990s. Um, but now it's switched back. Um, so people are responsive, but not, not in the sense they're not going to drive their car, but they are responsive, and when they make their purchasing decision, they pay attention to the price. And that's why the Europeans buy the efficient diesel cars. Um, and then now, the prices. Now, you see how much the price fluctuates. So these are some different events. So here's like the, that oil embargo in the 70s. You can see the price went from what, $5 a barrel to $40 a barrel in like you know, two weeks. Um, and then the Iran-Iraq war, and it went up by from what, 35 up to 65. So more than a factor of two, again, maybe in six months. Um, and then we had some wild things happen over here. Uh, and so this um, illustrates uh, a very important thing to keep in mind. The price can go wild. And this is because of the inelastic demand. So people still want the fuel. And if there's a shortage of fuel for any reason, the price just goes up, 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 up. Because people, a lot of people have enough money and they're willing to pay anything for it. Right? It's just like food. Right? If you have a famine, the food price just goes up and up and up because everybody wants to eat. Right? It's almost the same with oil. That if you have a car, you want to drive it. And so the food price can go way high if there's a shortage. It also can collapse. So you can see here, for example, in the 90s, this just went down to $16, $12, $12 a barrel or something. Okay. Now, unfortunately, that was the uh, year I started as a new professor. I was trying to do fuel chemistry. Nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, we got fuel. We got as much fuel as we want. It's cheap. What's the problem? Uh, but then uh, things sort of took off. And you can see that I got a lot more students in 2005 than I did in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, a problem with this is if you're a researcher and you're trying to invent a, a technology that's competing with conventional oil, um, what price does, does your technology have to meet in order to beat conventional oil, in order to be, make it in the market? It's really hard to know because when you make your technology, I invent it now, it might not be deployed large scale until seven, eight, nine, ten years from now. What price is the oil going to be then? Who knows, right? If you look at this historical record, it could be anywhere, right? You know, it could definitely fluctuate at least at one order of magnitude, up and down. And so that makes it very difficult. And for an investor, if I go to an investor and say, OK, give me $100 million so I can build a factory to make my new alternative fuel, and the guy calculates and he says, well, at current prices, this is great. I'm going to make a lot of money. But then he looks at this chart and he thinks, what happens if the factory opens a year when the price is like that? 
and then he'll go bankrupt, right? He's giving, he won't get any money back from his investment. So he's going to charge you a, a, what we could call a risk premium. He's going to say, well, I'm only going to give it to you if you have 100% rate of return in year one, you know? Because um, otherwise, I, I might lose my shirt. Um, and so that really inhibits the deployment of the technology. All right, another quiz. So, so talk to us everybody with your neighbors and see if we can get a consensus answers. All right, so the fuel prices you just saw started rising dramatically around 2000, and it's remained really historically high ever since with a mi modest dip in 2008 during the economic crash. Um, and because of this, the gasoline consumption has been dropping in the USA and Western Europe because of the high price. Uh, people are buying more efficient cars. And, uh, and all through this period, the, the price has been much, much higher than the cost of producing the oil. Okay? So why do you think this happened? Why did the price rise? And why is it staying high even though the oil production is going up like crazy? OK, so it could be psychological factors. That's a possibility. Uh, other suggestions? They talk, to, talk to each other. You've got to see if figure it out. Figure it out. All right, you guys figure it out? Anybody? Back here there. Overall world demand has been increasing, like in China and India. Ah, yes. So right now, I think there's more cars sold in China than there are in the United States, maybe in all of North America. Um, so the, the, all through this period, China especially, but actually Southeast Asia, India, um, have people buying cars like crazy. And if, what do you do when you buy a car? You buy fuel, right? So the world uh, production has been going up, but the world demand is going up even faster. And so uh, we've been have the prices just go up and up and up and just stay up uh, because the we have an imbalance that the demand just keeps going up because people buy new cars every year. More and more people are buying cars. All right. Um, there's a, a complication I should have mentioned actually during this that on top of the real economic price, which is, you, know, you think would be related to the cost of production, there's a, uh, another thing going on is that there's sort of collusion among the sellers. So originally, in this country, there was a standard oil, had a monopoly over all the oil, uh, basically all the oil in the world. And they, they had a monopoly all over the place. And they got broken up by the government into all the companies, so Exxon, um, uh, Amico, uh, Chevron. All those used to be one company. And they all got broken up. So that was the first time. But that was the, so they artificially held the price high because they, the, they had all the production. Then the price collapsed. And the price was low for a while. And then somebody else started colluding. And that was all the OPEC countries. And so they all got together and said, let's raise the price together. And we're just going to restrict the demand. And so they had some pretty good effect with that for a while. But then in the 1990s, I think they had some internal arguments. And so they, they, didn't, they sat, didn't cooperate as well. And they started overproducing. And so then the price dropped again. Um, yeah? Um, so that was uh, because of this huge um, pre um, shortage of oil, it caused a massive inflation in the United States. So uh, the government was desperate and trying to figure out what to do. And so to try to stop the inflation, they, caused, they made wage and price controls. You weren't allowed to give anybody a raise. You weren't allowed to raise the price of anything you sold in the stores. Um, but they couldn't beat it because the, the overall economics was that they wanted to buy oil. People wanted to drive their cars. So they needed more money. And so then there was this huge pressure to print money. Yeah, oh yeah, actually, all kinds of troubles in the 70s from this. Um, yeah. So anyway, that was one. 
one attempt. You see it actually had like no effect, right? The oil price went up anyway. Uh, so the, government, the government's ability to defeat total economics is a problem. Actually, right now this is happening in several countries around the world are, are thinking of getting rid of their subsidies. So many countries subsidize the cost of fuel to their citizens. Um, and then what's happening now is the price of oil is so high and more and more people are driving, so the volume of fuel that's going through is more, so the cost of the subsidy is going through the roof. And so even countries that are pretty rich are having trouble to maintain the subsidy as high as they were. And so there's a big political movement to get rid of the subsidies. Of course, the people who were buying the fuel are suddenly are mad because now they have to pay a lot more for the fuel than they did before. So there's a lot of politics, and who knows how it's going to work out. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the situation. All right, sorry. Let's keep going here. All right, so these fuel price fluctuations are big problems in a couple of ways. One is that uh, we've had several cases where the fuel prices spiked and then drove the whole world economy into recession um, because it, it, the economy couldn't respond fast enough to the giant change in prices. And there wasn't enough money floating around the system to handle it. Um, so that happened in 1974, 1980, and 2008. Um, this other thing was I was mentioning was the risk it adds to any energy project, and especially to alternative fuel projects, um, is you really don't know what the price has to be, because the price fluctuates like crazy. Um, and uh, there's definitely a possibility, there's still, OPEC still has some control over the prices, not, not perfect control, but some. And uh, there's still a possibility that if, if OPEC felt threatened, they could dump the price, because their production prices are like less than $10 a barrel. And so they could, they could sell for $15 a barrel and make good money. But all the producers who are producing like in uh, Kazakhstan or Siberia or someplace like that, they can't produce it at that, at that cheaper price. And so they could all be driven out of business. And also, if you made your alternative fuel plant, you could be driven out of business too. Um, and I don't think OPEC has ever really done this, but Standard Oil did that. <laughs> so we have a historical record of, uh, of people doing that kind of stuff. And it's definitely a possibility. That anyway adds to the risk. So because of all this risk, the investors and this kind of things really demand very high rates of return. And in fact, even the big oil companies do. So I was working at Exxon, and they used to tell me, don't work on any project that makes less than 30% rate of return. So 30% is tough. I mean, it's hard to invent something that's going to give you 30% you know, in year one uh, profit on an investment. So anyway, but that's because uh, of this whole risk situation. Um, and, and from the point of view of the companies, there's an additional risk is of nationalization. So if a company develops some oil field, it turns out it's really productive, the local people might say, hey, how come that company's making all the money of our natural resource? And they might say, okay, sorry, we changed the rules. Now it's our oil. Um, and so the, the oil companies sort of don't want to be too successful, because if they are, then they might get taken over. So, and that's happened several times. All right, so let's broaden from oil to fossil fuels in general. So you have a lot of reasons why we might want to use fossil fuels and why we might not want to. So first the thing is, there's a really a large amount of fossil fuel. So um, that we're going to definitely uh, uh, run out of fossil fuel eventually, but it's, it's a really long-term issue. It's like centuries issue. Um, right now, if you want to get fossil fuel, you can get it. We have many, many oil wells. We have many coal mines. We have natural gas fields out the wazoo. And we know where there's a lot more under the earth. And so you can dig it out, and you can get fuel. So if you want fuel, you can get it. Um, this is very different than almost all the other energy sources, where if you try to think of the scale of 80 million barrels per day, there's not very many sources of energy that can give you that kind of scale. Um, and also, although the price of oil is high, it, the production cost is not really that high. So you know, from the point of view of society, how much effort do we have to spend in producing some energy? Fossil fuel is not very much effort for the amount of energy you get. Um, and you know, the coal price for, in particular, if you want energy to run and make electricity, you can, you know, one coal miner can make enough energy to support a whole village um, by just digging some dirt stuff out of the ground. So it's not, it's not that hard to produce a lot of energy. Um, a, a, an issue against fossil fuels is the greenhouse effect. So um, I'll talk more about this later, but the, as we're burning the, the carbon, the fossil fuel, the, C, the carbon's ending up in the atmosphere, CO2, and it's changing um, how, the opacity of the atmosphere to infrared light. And that turns out to have an effect that of trapping uh, heat inside on the Earth that normally would have been radiated out to space. And that heats up the Earth. And that changes all the weather and has all kinds of second-order effects. Um, 
And so this is a big problem. And people try to think of different ways to try to get rid of the CO2. Um, and there are some ideas for that, but it's basically pretty tough. So basically, right now, we just let it all go in the air. So we have oil that's expensive right now, but it might not stay expensive forever. It may be the oil is going to run out, but not anytime really soon. It's definitely not secure, because the oil is mostly located far away from where the people live and are consuming the oil. And it's definitely a greenhouse gas problem. And so all these, for all these reasons, you might want to use alternative fuels. And then once you change the fuel, you have to worry about how the fuel chemistry has changed from what the fuel you're used to and how that's going to affect the engines, the environment, and so on. All right, so here's another question for you. I guess this is actually question number three. Um, question, it's question number two, too. Um, Shell just built a big, giant gas-to-liquids plant that makes liquid diesel fuel in Qatar. And... Um, but right now, US truck companies are uh, making trucks that burn natural gas, uh, both compressed natural gas and actually liquid, liquefied natural gas, too. Um, and they're investing a lot of money in that. So in the one place, they're changing from using diesel to using gas. In the other place, they're taking gas and changing it into diesel. Does this make any sense? Yes. Is this unanimous? How many people say yes? How many people say no? How many people have no opinion will reserve judgment? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have mostly yeses. So let's have a uh, yes. We have a yes? There we go. Yes? Uh, it's much easier to ship LNG to Hawaii to power the power plants as a liquid form than as a gas in anywhere but Hawaii is just a great example. OK, so if you have gas someplace far away from where people want to use it, and you can liquefy it or make it into a diesel fuel or something, you could ship it around a lot more easy. That's, that's definitely for sure true. OK, so that sort of says why Shell is making gas to liquids in Qatar, because not that many people live in Qatar. They don't need that much gas. They have plenty. They have the biggest gas field in the world. Uh, so, so the Shell decision makes some sense. How about the other one? The, why truck companies are trying to make their trucks use gas instead? Um, so the buses in the cities, they're concerned mostly with the emissions, but I think the truckers don't care. They only have to meet the regulation. They don't care about exceeding the regulation. Yeah? Does that have anything to do with fracking? Ah, fracking. So to expand. Well, the price, I mean, I suppose you can buy it as gas. Okay, that's right. So um, converting the gas into liquid costs money. Um, so the Qatar, I think, was one of the biggest investments of all time when they built up the Shell plant to convert uh, uh, gas to liquid. In fact, I think it made the world steel price like, increase significantly just because of this one plant, because they bought that much steel. <laughs> so, um, and they also used up like, all, the, all the skilled labor and welders and stuff in the whole Middle East is basically working this one project. Um, so the labor price went up like crazy, too. So, uh, so definitely it's cheaper if you don't have to do anything. So if you're, if you're in, in the United States, and right now at this moment, they have a fracking technology, you have lots and lots of natural gas becoming available all of a sudden, then if you could, instead of trying to convert that into anything, just use it directly, it's cheaper. So it's the same thing actually works for both, right? That the gas is cheap and the liquid's valuable, or the transportation is actually what's valuable. And in the United States, you could just compress it. You don't have to shift the compressed gas very far because the trucks are close by. But if you're in Qatar, it's actually more difficult. You compress gas and try to ship it all the way to the United States to the trucks. It's, it's, not, it's not so easy. So, that's, so these things are both, both driven by the same thing. The gas and the oil price have a very big difference right now, particularly in places where we have a lot of gas, in Qatar and the United States. All right. So because uh, of the problems with conventional fuels, um, a lot of people for a long time have been trying to figure out alternative fuels. So let's consider, if you were going to change the fuel to something else, what would we want? So what do you want in a fuel? Um, and, and sort of there's a lot of constraints. If you're going to replace the existing fuels, you basically can't be worse than the existing fuels in anything that's really important. Otherwise, people are going to say, why am I changing from something that's pretty good to something that's worse? Right? So I have to, a lot of things I have to satisfy. So let's try to see if we can enumerate those. 
All right, so the first thing is you want to carry energy. That's the whole purpose of the fuel. And you want to have a high energy density, so you don't want the thing to be heavy. So you really would prefer if you didn't have to carry more than one reactant on the fuel. You only have to one tank, and you want to carry the weight of the stuff in the one tank. And so if you can make your second reactant be the, the atmosphere, um, then that's, that's great. And so uh, um, if, you, if you want to do that, well, you can't react to nitrogen because it's inert. You can't react to argon because it's inert. So I guess you're going to react to oxygen. That's what that's left in the atmosphere. Um, and so you want to find some material that has a very exothermic reaction with O2 because you want to make a lot of heat from burning your fuel with the O2. Um, now, we talked a lot about price and also the magnitude of the demand, which is huge. So you need to find some material that reacts with O2 that's present everywhere, hopefully, really cheap, super easy to get, okay? Because we want to use a tremendous amount of it. Um, so that's going to kind of restrict what we can do. Um, and then you want the, the fuel itself, ideally you want it to be renewable or something that you can somehow make. Um, because we have this problem with the other fuels that they're going to run out if they're not renewable. And also, uh, the, fu the carbon fuels we're using right now, are, we're emitting the CO2, and the CO2 is going to cause a greenhouse problem. So there's sort of a, a tricky re requirement for sustainability on the fuel. And also environmentally behind, benign. So if you have a fuel and it's used in the scale of 80 million barrels per day, how much of it do you think is going to get spill or leak? Any idea? Yeah, maybe a percent, right? Something like that. So, you know, what's a percent of 100 million barrels per day? It's a million barrels per day. It's a lot of leak, right? Um, so, you know, if, you, if you're going to have something 1%, even if you're good and you have 0.1%, 99.9% of your fuel does exactly what you want, 0.1% of it gets lost or gets spilled or has an accident, that's still a lot of material. So you ha can't have anything that's too disastrous if you spill it. And people don't do everything perfectly. And so, you know, you tell the truck driver to carefully drive the truck full of fuel to the plant. Somebody's going to have an accident, right? You got to tell the guy, wear the right equipment, carefully seal up the, the pipe between the truck and the fuel tank. Somebody's going to do it wrong, it's going to spill, right? Not to mention, people don't maintain stuff, so the, the tank is going to get leaks because they forget to maintain it, and, right? It's just this normal life. And so you have to expect you're going to have problems. So that means you can't do anything that's too poisonous. Um, and you prefer that after you did the reaction, the products of the reaction are things you could just dump in the environment without any harm. Um, because otherwise, you have to carry them around with you. So you drive the car, and then you're accumulating your products. Um, it's sort of like in the old days, the horses uh, in the cities, they had to have these little pooper scooper things you know, on the back of the horse. Right? It was much better than they could just dump it. Right? It was a lot easier for the, the, the horseman. You didn't have to deal with it. Um, and so the same thing, we want to be able to dump our exhaust. Um, now, if you're going to dump it, um, we're dumping millions of tons per day of the stuff. So it's got to be something really innocuous. Uh, and people are not going to complain about having your exhaust dumped in their front yard as you drive by. And um, you really don't want it to be solids. Because if you're making millions of tons of solids and scattering them all across the countryside, it's going to be a mess regardless, no matter what the solid is. And also just trying to make sure, just handling all that much material is going to be a problem. So you really want it to be liquids or gases if you're going to dump it. Okay, so the exhaust has to be a liquid or a gas as well, the products of the reaction. So here's a periodic table of all the elements we can make our alternative fuel out of. Okay. Um, so first we say, well, what energy density do we need? And uh, we need approximately a uh, gigajoule of energy on a car, because um, that's about the same as 10 or 20 gallons of gasoline. It's about what we have in a fuel tank right now, so 10 gallons. And so we need a gigajoule, but we don't want to carry more than, say, 100 kilograms of fuel. Yeah, if it was 1,000 kilograms of fuel, it'd be heavy, it's just as heavy as the car. Um, so we want it to be lighter than the car. So we need, you know, divide those two numbers, you need something about 10 kilojoules per gram of energy released by your reaction. So that's pretty, pretty much. Um, now, you can try to do this by using a really unstable fuel. 
a fuel that's say some isomer that's in an unstable form and it just would spontaneously unzip and go to something else. But it's dangerous to have your fuel be able to spontaneously react. Um, and so uh, instead, most people decide to take a fuel that's very stable and left alone and only reacts when you expose it to the oxygen. So that's our normal, our normal strategy. That's a safety strategy. So that means that the, the exothermicity of the reaction is basically going to be the heat of combustion of the stuff. Okay? Um, and in fact, the, you know, the heat of combustion of the element is enough to give you a rough idea of what this number is going to be. So if we just write down the elements that have an enthalpy of oxidation greater than 10 kilojoules per gram, we suddenly wiped out most of the periodic table. But these are the only elements that have such a high uh, energy per gram. So all the heavy metals and stuff, they all react with oxygen, but they're too heavy. So you have a big denominator. Um, and then the ones, uh, with some, some things don't react with oxygen that much. So the electronegative elements are all out of there. And so you're just left with these guys. Um, so that's really cut down our range of what we can put in our fuel. And we also require that we don't want to make a solid as our product, because we're going to either dump it or have to carry it around. Either way, we don't want to handle the solid. So that wipes out the metals. And so now we're left with uh, those guys. And if we combine those two requirements, that the oxide is not a solid and the uh, enthalpy of oxidation is greater than 10 kilojoules per gram, um, and also we require that the oxide not be a toxic, because we're going to dump it, then we get down to just these two elements. So the only two elements that satisfy those properties. So not surprising, all the fuels you know about are hydrocarbons because they're made of hydrogen and carbon, because that's the two elements that we can do. And um, we can actually put oxygen in the fuel if we want to. Um, it reduces the energy density, but as long as you have enough hydrogen carbons, you can kind of overwhelm it. So you can have a little bit of oxygen in there. So for example, ethanol has two carbons, what, five, six hydrogens, and one oxygen. That ratio is still OK, so you still have pretty good. You only lose about half your energy density with the oxygen. Um, but you couldn't put too many oxygens in, or you lose all your energy density. And we excluded nitrogen from this list because NOx is toxic. Um, however, there's a really, uh, really well-known catalyst that converts NOx into N2. So maybe if we really trust our exhaust control system a lot, we could actually put nitrogen in the fuel. Um, and then we'd, we just have to make sure we have a very good cat catalytic control to make sure we're not going to emit so much NOx from the fuel. Um, and, but again, uh, well, that's it. That's the, so that's our story. So we can do hydrogen and carbon for sure, a little bit of oxygen, but it doesn't really help much. And we can add maybe some nitrogen, but if we have good emission controls. And that's the only elements that work. All right. Um, all right. OK, so I just said all these things. Some more requirements. We don't want the fuel to be corrosive. But corrosive actually depends on what the materials of the tanks are. Um, so there's an issue here about how backwards compatible does the fuel have to be. If you can make an alternative fuel that you can just run in current cars, it makes it a lot easier to introduce to the market. So you know, one point of view is I only want to consider alternative fuels that I can say, for example, dilute into regular gasoline. And then they would go into people's cars, and they would work. But that means that, that your new fuel has to be really similar to existing gasoline. So it really restricts the range of possibilities. So there's kind of two possibilities. One is like fuels that are like missable, usable with uh, existing fuel. They call it drop-in fuels. You can just drop them into a gas tank. People still drive it. Everything's fine. And then there's another point of view is you say, well, I'm bold and brave. I'm finding a really alternative fuel. I'm going somewhere completely different and using some fuel that I can't drop in. But then you have the problem, you have to manufacture the vehicles that use this new fuel at the same time you as you manufacture the new fuel. And so you need two miracles to occur simultaneously instead of just one. So anyway, that you can use your own judgment about that. And then um, volatility. So uh, if you want fuels to burn, you want them to be liquid to carry them around, but you want them to evaporate easily. That means you have a very restricted volatility range that you can use for fuels. Things that are too heavy. Um, aren't going to work because they're going to stay liquid. Um, things that are too light won't be liquid in storage. They'll, they'll evaporate. And so you're in a narrower range of molecular weights. Um, and some molecules 
uh, will pyrolyze before they evaporate, like sugars, for example. So you can't use sugars in car. Otherwise, you make caramel and stuff. You don't actually make heat. All right, ignition delay. We're going to talk a lot about this later in the week. A very critical property of the fuels is the ignition delay. Um, that's what the octane number is. That's what the cetane number is. And what it is is that if you have a hot mixture of fuel and air, if you wait long enough, usually it will ignite. And that time of how long it takes be between the time you heat it and the time it ignites is really crucial for most internal combustion engines. Um, it's also very tricky. It's very sensitive to the fuel structure. It's sensitive to the exact conditions. Um, and so this is a major research topic for a long time. It's been trying to understand how ignition delays depend on all those, those quantities. Um, and people have a lot of different tests for this, and they actually give different results, and it's very confusing. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk about this some more. Um, and different engines want different things. So diesels, for example, want fuels that have very short ignition delays, and gasoline wants fuels that have very long ignition delays. And some other new engines, it's not so clear. Uh, if you want short or long, it depends exactly how you operate the engine. Uh, actually, Professor Wrights, uh, who was giving a talk this morning, a lecture this morning, anyway, he, so he invented an engine that it works best if you have one fuel that has a very short ignition delay and another fuel that has a very long ignition delay. And if you have them both, the difference between the ignition delays is what's important, not the individual number for either one. So anyway, so there's a lot of different, different ideas about what to do with that. Um, and this is just an example to show how, how sensitive things are. Um, these are the measured ignition delays in the solid dots for butanol, which is a proposed alternative fuel. And um, you can see that changing the stoichiometry over a factor of two is causing something like a factor of five, almost an order of magnitude change in the ignition delay. So it's a very sensitive thing. And it also depends pretty strongly on the temperature. So the x-axis is the temperature. And you can see how the ignition delay is zooming up as we lower the temperature. And so this is tricky, too, because sometimes when you operate an engine, you're not sure exactly what, what temperature you have in the engine. It's usually not homogeneous. Usually you have different end temperatures at slightly different locations inside the cylinder. And so this is actually a, a very complicated story about the ignition delay. Um, and well, that's it. So yeah, and also this shows the chemical structure. So N-butanol uh, has an octane number of 86. And uh, isobutanol, which is the same molecule, just moving one methyl group over, um, has an octane number of 98. So you have wildly different ignition behavior just by changing one methyl group one location. So this is the kind of stuff that chemists like me really love, because it's like, wow, I can change my molecule a little tiny bit and make this huge effect. Um, but it's the kind of stuff that mechanical engineers hate, because they have to worry about where the heck that methyl group is, and they can never remember in the first place. <laughs> so anyway, that's the way the reality is. All right, another uh, quantity that we care about is flame speed. So uh, some kinds of engines, like spark ignited engines, require a sufficient flame speed. If the flame speed is too slow, the cylinder motion, the piston motion is faster than the flame speed, you won't burn all the fuel um, during, the, during the stroke, or won't be burned at the right time. So this is pretty important. However, this turns out not to be such a hard requirement, because a lot of fuels have very similar flame, flame speeds. Um, and so, it's not as sensitive as the ignition delays. Um, but you can get into the situations where it does matter. So for example, in, uh, uh, in tur gas turbines, they would really like to run them as low temperature as possible to try to reduce the NOx emissions as much as possible. And to do that, then they're running right at the limit where the flame speed is getting so low it can barely keep the flame sustained. And then you can get all kinds of instabilities and other kinds of problems. Um, so there's some situations where you really care about this a lot. But the biggest one is it has to be cheap. And you need a lot of it, because uh, we use so much fuel. Um, and you're going to be competing probably with petroleum whenever you invent, introduce your new fuel. And petroleum is available in huge quantities, and it's really cheap. And so um, you know, maybe you can get your local government to give you a subsidy or some regulation that requires people to use your new fuel because it's good for the environment or something. But if you want all the countries in the world to use your fuel, you can't count on any subsidy program or any tax or special regulation to really help you. If you're going to try to be significant and really affect the world, you need it to be cheap. Um, 
you also have to allow for the fact that you have to prove that your fuel is not going to damage people's engines. So you claim it's a drop-in fuel, but the engine manufacturers are going to be look, kind of look at you kind of suspiciously because they warranty the engines, and if you put some fuel in, it causes some of their engines to break. The engines are expensive to replace uh, compared to your cheap fuel, and they'll be really annoyed if you wreck it. So they're going to try to fight you all the way in all the committees and the regulatory agencies to stop your fuel from coming in. Um, and also, you need a lot of investors to, get, to make, if you're going to make a million barrels per day of your new fuel, you need a pretty darn big plant. And so you're going to need a lot of money, a lot of capital. So you have to really prove that it's going to be really economically viable, uh, really cheap, really good, no problems. Everyone's going to be happy. You have to prove that to your investors. You prove that to the government. Prove that to the engine manufacturers. So you, you, have, you have a pretty big burden of proof on the, if you're going to introduce an alternative fuel. Um, and unless you can make a big enough volume of it, it's not worth it. Because you have to do the same proof regardless of the scale. Um, and so, but if you want to make, get the money back, you've got to sell a lot of fuel. And so the only way you make this work out is you need you know, a million barrels per day kind of scale of the new fuel, um, which really limits what you can do. So I'm not going to make something out of some really exotic molecule that I need to synthesize in the milligram quantities or something. It's not going to make it. Um, all right, so there's a the summary. So we need a high, high energy density, only contains carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe some nitrogen. Uh, can't be corrosive, can't be too horrible if it spill it. It has the right volatility, uh, has the right ignition delay, has the right flame speed, and mostly it's got to be cheap and plentiful. Um, and then there's a lot of other issues, which I'm not going to talk about here, but if you actually get to the point of having a fuel that satisfies those top ones, those are the top main requirements, you'll have to prove you satisfy all these other ones. Um, so there's a whole standard agency, like the ASTM, and they regulate the fuels, and they have all these regulations because something horrible happened before with the fuel that didn't fulfill it. So somebody burned to death, some fishes got killed, some, something happened, some engines wouldn't start. And so for each of those things, they have all these other uh, requirements that your fuel is going have to have to meet. Um, and uh, if you get into it, I would recommend you join the ASTM committee. And then you can negotiate with them to try to persuade them that your fuel is fine. <laughs> OK, um, maybe we should take a break right now. And when we come back, I'll teach you some basics about the chemistry.